Good day, Grade Tens. Welcome to this next lesson in physical and um, chemical change. And we're looking at different parts of our physical and chemical change. In this lesson, in the last lesson, we spoke about the conservation of the number of atoms. So we counted up the number of atoms on the left hand side and the number of atoms on the right hand side. And when we did that, we saw that they equaled the same. So if you look on the left hand side and you count up how many hydrogens you have, how do you, how many do you have? Do you agree that you have got, oh, sorry, I'm just getting my mouse to work. You've got, if we're just talking about, we're not talking mass now, we're talking about the number. If you look at the number of hydrogens that you have on the left hand side, what is going on today again? Just a second. Oh, there we go. Um, sorry about that. I'm just struggling a little bit with my, that's not an eraser. There we go. Okay, so if we look on the left hand side, do you see you've got two times two hydrogens, which equals four hydrogens, right? And also two times two oxygens, so it becomes four oxygens. If we look on the right hand side, we've got two times two, which is four hydrogens. And the oxygens are two times one, so it's two times one oxygen plus two oxygens, which equals four oxygens. So that's what we, pr we, we proved in the last lesson. We proved that the number of atoms on the left-hand side of the reaction always have to equal the number of atoms on the right-hand side of the reaction. Now, we're gonna do it with respect to molar mass, okay? So we're looking at the molar mass of the reactants and products. So we know that the molar mass of hydrogen is one and the molar mass of oxygen is 16. So let's work that out. So we've got two multiplied by, this is two times one, two times one plus two times 16, okay? Two times one plus two times 16. So it's two, okay, two times one is just two. Two times 16 is 32. Okay, so it's 2 times 34, which is 68. There we go. If we look at the right hand side, we've got 2 times 2 times 1, that's the hydrogen, plus your oxygen, okay, plus 2 times 16 over here, because this is a diatomic molecule. So that becomes 2 times 2 plus 16 is 18 plus 2 times 16 is 32. So 2 times 18 is a 6. 2 eighths of 16 carry 1. 2 into 2 plus 1 is 36 plus 32, which equals 68. So you can see that therefore the mass is conserved in a chemical reaction. No mass is gained or lost, and that's very, very important. So Basically, that comes to a law, and the law is the law of constant, okay, this is a different law. The law that we were talking about here was the law of the conservation of matter, which said that matter wasn't used or destroyed or created or destroyed, only transferred from one area to another within a reaction. Now we've got a law of constant composition. What it states is that atoms of different elements combine, always combine in a fixed ratio in order to form the same products. But what does this mean? Basically what we're saying is that if you put hydrogen and oxygen together in a container and you make it into the right conditions, then the hydrogen and oxygen will always combine to form a water molecule where there is two hydrogens for every one oxygen. They're never gonna join up with like, I don't know, oxygen with one hydrogen and another oxygen and then a hydrogen. It's never gonna do that. If you put hydrogen molecules and oxygen molecules into a container, set the correct conditions so that they will actually react, okay, then they will always form water molecules, okay, and it's the same with everything else. Okay, now, what we're going to do is we're going to balance a couple of equations. Um, that's actually early, we need to be moving that. Give me half, okay, now I'll just go back. So in order to, we're now going to represent our chemical change and we're going to learn how to balance some equations. So unfortunately these are, I moved some pages around and obviously I moved those too early. 
So it says, first of all, you need to identify and write down the reactants in words. This is if you're given an equation in words similar to this, which we will talk about in a minute, okay? Um, you write these on the left. Then you draw an arrow to indicate that there is a reaction and to separate the reactants from the products. Then you identify and write down the products in the words. The products are written on the right. Oh, I apologize for typo. The pro products are right, written on the right. Now you write down the symbols and formula for each reactant and product and then balance the equation. Okay, so let's have a look at an example. So they're saying sugar reacts with oxygen. We breathe in to produce carbon dioxide, water, and energy. Okay, so what did they say? They said we take the reactants on the left-hand side. So we're going to go sugar plus oxygen. Okay, and it reacts to produce carbon dioxide. Okay, water and energy, but you don't have to write your energy. Right? So now we've done the word re reaction, word equation. Now we need to change it into our formula and our symbols. So they've been very nice and they've given us the formula for sugar. So that is going to be C6H12O6. Remember that oxygen is a diatomic molecule, so for that reason it's going to be O2. Carbon dioxide is CO2, and then we form water. Right, and now we need to start balancing things. And honestly, what I would do is when I look at this, I'm going to balance the oxygens last because I've got oxygen by itself here, which makes it easier to manipulate than the things that are with other compounds. So let's balance the oxygen last. Okay, so do you agree we've got six carbons here and we've got one here, so we're going to multiply this by six. Okay, we've got 12 hydrogens here and we've got two hydrogens here, so I'm going to multiply that by six because six times two is going to give me 12. Now let's look at the oxygens. We've got six plus two is equal to eight oxygens, whereas here we have got six times two is 12 plus six times one is six, which is 18. Okay, but if you think about what's happening here, do you agree that if we don't want to mess with this, if we want to leave this as six, okay, then do you agree we've actually just got to mess with this? So we can say eight minus six is two. So we really need to somehow get two to equal to 12, because if I subtract the six here, I'm going to end up with 12. In other words, I'm saying I've already got six oxygens and just need to get the rest that are available. Okay, so 18 minus six is 12. So I need to find 12 oxygens so I can multiply this by six. So let's just check that and I'll change my colors again. If you do this, you've got six oxygens plus six times two is 12 oxygens, which is 18. Yeah, you've got six times two, which is 12, plus six times two, which is six, which is 18. So now my oxygens are balanced as well. And that's my final reaction. C6H12O6 plus 6O2 plus 6CO2 plus 6H2O. Easy peasy, right? Right, so now what I've planned is for us to do a whole bunch of examples of balancing the equations because I think that this is very important. Um, I find that a lot of students forget to balance the equations or don't do it accurately and then of course when they're doing stoichiometry, which is basically using your mass and your moles and your molar mass and your volume and your concentration. When you do those equations, you're going to get them wrong unless you got your equation to be balanced, okay? Your reaction equation to be balanced. So let's work through it, okay? So magnesium, I know we said let the last thing by itself be balanced last, and I'm sticking with that, okay? But do you agree that magnesium at the moment is one and here yeah, it's one as well, so we're cool with it, okay? But yeah, chlorine is Cl2, and yeah, there's Cl1, so we're going to put a double, two, we're going to put a two in front of that. That gives you two chlorines now, and also we've got two hydrogens. And my word, that's balanced. There you go. So the reaction is Mg plus 2HCl goes to MgCl2 plus 
H2. Just check two hydrogens, two hydrogens, two chlorines, two chlorines, one magnesium, one magnesium. Easy peasy. Now, I know that some of you have a method where you use a little table, and that's fine. You're welcome to use that method. I find that um, a lot of my students find the table to be very confusing, so I tend not to teach it, and I tend to rather go through things nice and slowly. If you want to, I can help you by doing this. We can go left-hand side, and we can go right-hand side, and then what we can do is we can write it out. We can go carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, and then we go carbon, hydrogen, oxygen. So if you wanted to, you could do it like this, and then if we did it like that, we would say, okay, fine, let's start on the left-hand side. Do you see we've got one carbon here? We got four hydrogens here, and we got two oxygens, okay? On the right-hand side, we have got one carbon, which is wonderful, but we've got two hydrogens, and we've got three oxygens, okay? So that means we need to balance. So obviously, if we multiply this one by two, okay, do you agree that's now four, okay? Does it change the number of carbons? No, it's still one. What about the oxygens? The oxygens now are two times one is two plus two is four. So now the oxygens are four. So what do we need to do? We need to fix the oxygens. So then if we put a two in front of that, that becomes two times two, which is four. And there we go, balanced. One, four, four, one, four, four. So if you guys find it easier to use a table like this and rather work with that, that's fine. It doesn't really matter how you do this as long as you get it right. Okay, let's move on to some other examples. So these examples again are like the ones I've done before where you have the word sentence. We need to break it into up into a proper word equation and then convert. So we're going ammonia reacts with oxygen to form nitrogen monoxide. Nitrogen monoxide and water. Okay, right, so that's the, what's happening. Now we need to work out how what the equation is. So ammonia, do you agree, is NH3? NH3 plus oxygen is a gas, is a diatomic gas, as O2, goes to nitrogen monoxide, is just going to be NO. Mon means one. So nitrogen monoxide means that there's only going to be one oxygen to it, plus water. Ah. And what is water? Water is H2O. Okay, H. To okay, so now let's start counting up on the left hand side and the right hand side. On the left hand side, we've got one nitrogen and we've got one nitrogen. Awesome. But yeah, we've got three hydrogens and yeah, we've got two hydrogens. Okay, so do you agree that if I multiply this by three and I multiply this by two, what does that do? I now have six hydrogens, six hydrogens, and I've got six hydrogens there. Awesome. But now what's happened to my nitrogens? Nitrogens here, I now have two nitrogens, but only one nitrogen here. So now I need to double this up, okay? If I do that, I now have two nitrogens as well, which is great. But now let's look at the oxygens, the oxygens. And do you see I've got two oxygens here, but yeah, I've got two plus three, which is five oxygens. Okay, so now we're gonna do a little trick, okay? We've got five oxygens here and we've got two there. So do you agree that there's a nice little trick that we can play where we actually multiply everything by, I'll show you now. So we want this to be the same as five. So if I multiply, so do you agree this would be five 
over 2 would be the actual answer because 5 over 2 multiplied by 2 would give me 5 moles of oxygen, okay? But obviously, we can't have a half a mole. There's no such thing as half a mole. A mole is a container full of a specific, and specific element, so you cannot have half a mole. So what we're going to do is double the whole thing. So it's going to become 4 NH3 plus 5O2 goes to 4NO plus 6H2O. There you go. So now you've learned a little trick to go where you've actually learned to double. Um, if you get an uneven number of moles that are left over, you can multiply by um, its, its fraction. Okay. In other words, we know it's supposed to have 5. So if we multiply by 2.5, then we've got 2 multiplied by 2.5 is going to equal 5. Okay, so it equals 5. Okay, so that's how I got the 5 there. And then obviously, um, we don't like half moles because they don't exist, then we have to multiply everything by 2 to get it balanced beautifully. Right, let's look at this. We've got barium chloride reacts with sulfuric acid. Barium chloride reacts with sulfuric acid. Okay, so barium, barium is in group sodium, lithium, potassium, barium. There it is. Is in group two. Barium is in group two. So it has a charge of two plus. Chlorine is in group seven. So it has a charge of minus one. Okay. So we know therefore that this is going to be BaCl2. Right. React to sulfuric acid. So we know that that's going to be plus H2SO4 to produce barium sulfate. Okay, from this, you can see that this is SO4 to minus, but barium is 2 plus, so therefore it just becomes barium sulfate plus hydrochloric acid is HCl. Right, and now we need to balance. Oopsie. Now we need to balance. So let's have a look. Barium, one barium, one barium. Two chlorines means that we have to put a big two in front of the HCl. So now we've got two hydrogens, gives us two hydrogens. One sulfur is one sulfur. Four oxygens, four oxygens. Yay! So that's nice and balanced. So probably the trickiest thing of this expression or this question where you actually had to write out the equation is knowing how to write out barium chloride. Sulfuric acid you guys should have learnt and sulfate you should have learnt and hydrochloric acid you should have learnt somewhere along the line. Okay, so the only tricky one was barium chloride. Right, let's move on. Ethane, and they nicely give you the equation which is C2H6, reacts with oxygen to form carbon dioxide and steam. Now what is steam? Steam is hot, hot, very hot water. Okay, it is water in the gaseous phase. Okay, so now we're saying ethane, which is C2H6, reacts with oxygen to form carbon dioxide and hot water steam. Okay, so now let's write out the equation. We've got C2H6 plus oxygen as a gas, O2, forms carbon dioxide, CO2, plus steam, which is going to be H2O. Okay, so now what we need to do is look at this, okay? And again, what I'd like to do is, I think I'm going to draw a table again, just so you guys, if you guys are using tables in class and you do struggle to do it the way I'm doing it that you get practice doing tables so let's draw a table so the first thing I need to do is change color so we're gonna go left hand side and we're gonna go right hand side 
and our reaction are three things on the left hand side and three things on the right hand side and it's carbon hydrogen oxygen carbon hydrogen oxygen Okay, so let's get going. On the left hand side, how many carbons do you have? Do you agree that we've only got one molecule that's carbon, got carbon in it? And that molecule has got two carbons. There you go. Yeah, we've got six hydrogens. And yeah, we've got two oxygens. On this side, we've got one carbon. We've got two hydrogens and we've got three oxygens. Okay, so what do we start with? Okay, oxygen is alone on the left hand side. Do you see that oxygen is alone on the left hand side? So if that's the case, remember what I said to you, we're going to start with not oxygen. <laughs> we're going to do oxygen last. What we're going to do is do the others and then see if we need oxygen to balance out the numbers, okay? So on the left hand side, we've got two carbons. Here we go. On the right hand side, we've got one carbon. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna multiply this by two. What does that do now to this? This becomes two times carbons, that's now a two. Doesn't change my hydrogen. So what does it do to my oxygens? My oxygens are two times two is four, plus one, it's now five oxygen. Okay, before we start panicking about the oxygens, let's look at the hydrogens. On the left hand side, how many hydrogens do I have? Do you agree I've got six hydrogens on my left hand side? And on my right hand side, I still have two. Now remember grade 10, you can't just randomly add extra elements in, okay? You actually have to always multiply the num by the number of molecules that you're getting. Okay, do you see what I'm saying? So in other words, you can't just go, oh, I need more hydrogen, so let me just add hydrogen onto the right hand side. You can't do that. But you, what you can do is go, well, it obviously then it's gonna make more water. Okay, so we've got six hydrogens on the left hand side. So therefore I'm gonna multiply this by three, because three times two is six. That changes this to six. But now what does it do to this oxygen? We now have two times two, which is four, plus three times one, which is now five. How is that, no, how is that not changing? Two times two is four plus three. Oh, sorry, two times two is four plus three is seven. So we now got seven oxygens. Okay, so remember what I said here is a trick when you've got an odd number of oxygens on the one side and an even number. We multiply by the half of it, okay? So in other words, we can call this K if you want to, if this is, makes it easier for you, you can go K times two has to equal to seven, okay? We've got seven oxygens on the right-hand side and we've got two oxygens on the left-hand side. What do we have to multiply K about? So K has to equal to seven over two, therefore this becomes seven over two. So now our reaction looks like, hang on a minute, give me half a second. Like this, where this is seven over two. But there's a problem, what's the problem? The problem is that you can't have half a mole. As I always say to my students, it's the same as saying having half an egg, okay? Unless you scramble the egg and then pour out half of it, which is still very hard to do, you cannot have half an egg, okay? Same with a mole, a mole is a whole entity, okay? So you cannot have half a mole. So we can't have three and a half moles, which is what seven over two stands for. So what we need to do is we need to multiply everything by two. So that's what we're gonna do. So I'm gonna change color here to purple and I'm gonna multiply this by two. If I multiply this by two, this just becomes seven. And I multiply this by two, it becomes four. And if I multiply this by two, it becomes six. Okay, so let's just check it. But before we do that, let me just make this look prettier. Um, that's four and that's six. Okay, so let us just check that this works. So let's choose another color, let's go. So two times two is four. So now we've got four carbons. Um, hydrogens, two times six is 12 hydrogens and seven times two is 14 oxygens. Let's go over here four carbons, okay, how many hydrogens? 12 hydrogens, how many oxygens? Eight plus six is 14 oxygens. Yay, it works. 
Okay, so you can see that it doesn't matter whether you use a table or you use just putting numbers in the coefficients in and seeing what, what works. Um, it doesn't matter how you do it as long as you get it right. Okay, so now we're going to look at some slightly more complicated versions that we need to balance. Okay, so in this case, we've got ammonium carbonate, which is breaking up into ammonia plus carbon dioxide plus water. Ammonium carbonate it goes to ammonia plus carbon dioxide plus water. Okay, so again, you know what I'm going to do? I'm actually going to write that bigger in the middle so that we can play with it. We're going to go in H4. 2 CO3 breaks up into NH3 plus CO2 plus H2O. So this is the ammonium carbonate, right? So let's go through this. Okay, what you need to understand from this, what is going on here? It's not changing color. I wonder why not. <laughs> I wonder what's going on. Oh, there we go. What you need to understand about this is that this is saying that for every CO3 group of atoms, we have two ammonium compounds, NH4+. That's what this is saying. It's saying that there are two NH4s attached to one CO3. Okay, in which case your nitrogen is going to be what? Well, there are going to be two nitrogens in this case. There's two over here. Um, and you know what, I'm actually going to use a table for this. I think it'll be easier for you guys to understand. So let's do this. What's going on here? Okay, so we've got nitrogen, hydrogen, and carbon, and oxygen. And on the right hand side, we've got nitrogen, hydrogen, carbon, and oxygen. Okay, so do you agree on the nitrogen side, we've got two times nitrogen, which is two. The hydrogen, we've got two times four, which is eight. We've got one carbon and we've got three oxygens. Okay, on the right-hand side, we've got one nitrogen. We've got three plus two is five hydrogens. We've got one carbon and we've got two plus three, two plus one is three oxygens. So if we look at this, the nitrogens are different, the hydrogens are different, the carbon and the oxygen are the same. Okay, so let's play a little bit. Do you agree that I could multiply this by two? If I multiply that by two, I now have that this is two nitrogens and this is now two times three is six plus two is eight hydrogens and oh my word that's it that's how you balance it okay so it actually wasn't as difficult as we thought it would be which is wonderful okay but please understand that you wouldn't have got this right unless you understood that this two is multiplying the whole of this bracket okay so like I said for every carbonate there were two ammonium compounds um, added to it right let's look at another example but this time they've given us a word problem and we're going to have to convert it into a proper equation using symbols okay they say solid zinc metal reacts with aqueous hydrochloric acid to form aqueous solution of zinc chloride and hydrogen gas and how nice it is that they gave us the equation for zinc chloride they really didn't have to do that so we've got solid zinc let's write it out zinc plus aqueous hydrochloric acid, so that's hydrochloric acid, to form an aqueous solution of zinc chloride, so they've given it to us, so we can just write it in, plus hydrogen gas, hydrogen gas. And I suppose in this case and, and in others, you guys really need to know that if I say oxygen, I mean oxygen gas and therefore it's going to be diatomic. And the diatomic molecules on your periodic table are um, hydrogen, oxygen, nitrogen, and then all your halogens. So it's going to be fluorine, chlorine, bromine, 
and iodine. Every single one of these naturally occurs a diatomic molecule. So if I say that something reacts with fluorine, I'm assuming you know that I mean um, the diatomic molecule fluorine, because fluorine, when by itself, is called fluoride. Okay. So they didn't have to tell me hydrogen gas, they could just say it reacts with hydrogen and I would have known that that's a diatomic molecule. So we've got zinc, which is Zn, so it's by itself, plus aqueous hydrochloric acid, it's just to tell you that it's liquid, well not liquid, that it's dissolved in water, forms zinc chloride, ZnCl2, plus hydrogen gas, which is H2. Okay, so this is actually quite an easy one because how many zinc atoms do you have on the left hand side? Do you agree you've got one zinc atom on the left hand side? How many zinc atoms do you have on the right hand side? You've got one. How many hydrogen atoms do you have on the right hand side? Two. How many do you have on the left hand side? One. So let's multiply that by two. Okay, now how many chlorine atoms do you have on the left hand side? That's two. And how many on the right hand side? Two. Ta-da! You've just balanced this equation. How nice is that? Okay, so what's most important is that in equations, you're going to get other information, okay? And you need to recognize what these what this information is telling you because what you need to understand is that the phase of the matter in the equation is actually very, very important. I know that in grade 10, you might not think it's that important. You might think, oh, well, actually, it's not that big a deal because of the fact that um, I don't really play with the fact that we don't work with it, okay? But the thing is, when you get into older grades, higher grades, okay, you're going to have to work with equations and the sums that do not include solids and liquids, and they only include gases and aqua, okay? So what we need to do is explain the difference so that you can understand why it's important, okay? So first of all, obviously, S stands for solid. Okay, that's pretty obvious. What I think is the most complicated one for most people to understand is the one that goes from liquid and aqueous the liquid and the aqueous because to us they're both liquids okay they're both wet and runny okay <laughs> so as far as we're concerned liquid and aqueous are the same type of thing okay but actually there's a big difference if i say something is liquid i mean that it is pure okay there's nothing else in it okay it's only liquid okay so what does that mean it means that um, if I've got a water as a liquid, that water only has, that liquid only has water molecules on it, in it, only water molecules, okay? So, in other words, the whole jar is only filled with little water molecules. That's all that you find inside that jar. If it's an aqueous thing, we call it an aqueous solution, what has actually happened is that you've dissolved stuff into the water. And this is actually what we generally find unless the water is distilled, is inside this water, which is majority is the water molecules. Okay, the majority is the water molecules, HOs. But you'll maybe also find a little bit of salt that's been dissolved, or a little bit of magnesium, or a little bit of calcium, or all sorts of things that may have been dissolved into that water. And then we say it's aqueous, okay? So a pure liquid, an easier way to think of it is, because it's very seldom, except for water, that I think that liquids tend to be pure um, if they're compounds. So if you want to think of it this way, if you take an element, let's say mercury, okay, now mercury is liquid at room temperature. So when we use it in thermometers and that, okay, so it's liquid at room temperature. Um, that is a liquid. It's not a aqueous solution, it is a liquid because the only thing you'll find in that um, container that's holding the mercury is mercury atoms. That's nothing else. There won't be any other atoms found, okay? Whereas if it's an aqueous solution, then you've dissolved the substance into the water. Okay, so that's important. So, um, so an example of just an equation that has got 
um, letters is going to be Fe, 4Fe, which is a solid, plus 3 oxygen with a gas gives you 2FeO with this um, solid. And what it's really saying, just for the record, is that if we heat up iron in the presence of oxygen, we, find, we form iron oxide. Right, now, we're going to, just that we've been speaking about aqueous and um, aqueous versus liquid, we're now going to start talking about reactions in aqueous solutions. And the first thing we need to talk about is the polarity of water. So the whole point about aqueous solutions is that something dissolves in something else. And an aqueous solution is a solution where the solvent is water. Okay, but now I need you to understand something else. The official definition of a solute is basically a substance that dissolves into a into a liquid. Okay, so we always think, okay, when we're thinking sugar water, we think that the solute is sugar and then you've got the water, which is a solvent. Okay, happy with that. But now, but now, if you've got two liquids, okay, and they dissolve, so that they chemically mix, that's what I mean by dissolve, okay, they break up, then which is the solute and which is the solvent? And the answer is the one that is more is the solvent, and the one that is less is the solute. And that's all that they say. So basically they say the smaller number of the smaller the molar mass of the aqueous um, solution that's dissolved, the um, lot more, okay, so it's, the smaller one is going to be the solute and the bigger one is going to be the solvent. Okay, so now it says, why is water such a good solvent? Why is water such a good solvent? And it's all to do with its structure, all to do with its structure. The water molecule consists of an oxygen atom. You guys know this, okay? This consists of an oxygen atom and it's held together with a covalent bond with two hydrogen atoms. But now what is a covalent bond? You guys know this, I'm just gonna remind you. A covalent bond is a bond which shares the electrons. The electrons are shared between the two or more atoms, okay? So what we are saying is that the oxygen atom shares its electrons with the two hydrogens and the hydrogens in turn share the electrons with the oxygen. Okay, you will auto, automatically, automatically also notice that it is a bent thing, okay? It's, it's basically planar angular. In other words, it's on the same plane and it is angular in shape, okay? And you really don't have to worry about this length of the bond, but I will tell you quickly because it's almost the end of the lesson. This PM stands for picometers, picometers. And if you want to think of it this way, it's milli, micro, nano, and pico. So pico is 95,84 times by 10 to the negative 369,12 meters. 95.84 times by 10 to the negative 12 meters long. Okay, the distance between the oxygen atom and the hydrogen atom in that bond over there. Just tiny, very, very small. Okay, so what we will do is we will start here on our next lesson, which is next week, Tuesday. Thank you, great 10s. I hope you've learned something and have a great day. Cheers.